Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Security Health Plan Academy. Today we have Marshfield Clinic Health System Director of Bone Health and Osteoporosis, um, Dr. Allison Mayu, here to provide an overview of osteoporosis. Um, Allison will share information on the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of osteoporosis, as well as the impact of the disease on the overall health. She is board certified in general internal medicine and has certification in clinical, I'm going to say this, is it densitometry? <laughs> densitometry. Densi okay, there we go. This is why we have you here. I am so thrilled to have you um, for this month's in, um, Security Health Plan Academy. We are so lucky and fortunate, and I look forward to hearing your, your presentation. So without further ado, you can go ahead and, and take it from here. Well, thank you all for this really nice invitation. and. Um... I'm excited to present this to our patients and the security health pay, uh, plan members because this is an important topic because guess what? We're all getting older. Um, we, dis we discussed that uh, osteoporosis, when we go to the osteoporosis meetings, that uh, this is a pediatric disease with a geriatric outcome because it involves not only bone density, but bone structure. And as we age, we, we're considered to be facing a silver tsunami with this disease. Nearly 25% of the patients who suffer a hip fracture will die within 12 months. And to me, that was an alarming statistics when I, a statistic when I first started looking at this uh, disease. Another 20% are admitted to nursing home facilities for long-term care. In other words, losing their independence. And I think that scares my patients more than anything else. Um, the rate, the mortality rate of the first year is higher for men than for women. Men just don't do well with hip fractures. Fragility is the most common cause of fractures among seniors, but only 20% of these patients are getting best practice care. And up to 50% of all women after age 50 will have a fracture. And 25% of all men after age 50 will have a fragility fracture um, with their remaining lifetime. And this is a fragility fracture would be described as a fracture from a standing height fall. So this is just a general slide showing that we expect increased number of fractures, increased burden on our hospitals, increased costs. And we also have found out in studying this disease that a prior fracture is associated with an increased uh, risk for future fractures. So if you have a vertebral or a frac back fracture, you can have up to a 20% per year after that initial fracture. And after a hip fracture, you risk over the next 20 years having up to a 30% risk of fracture of the opposite hip. There are definitions of osteoporosis, uh, mainly by the World Health Organization. They look at a T-score, which is kind of an index that indexes the, the patient's grams per centimeter squared bone density with other young women across the country. Um, and, and I did say that right, young women. Normal is a T-score at or above negative 1.0. Osteopenia, which means your bones are thin, but not terribly brittle, supposedly, uh, between negative 1.0 and negative 2.5. And osteoporosis is diagnosed at or below negative 2.5 T-score. You can also diagnose osteoporosis if you have a low trauma or fragility fracture of the hip, pelvis, spine, or arm uh, with a T-score that looks like osteopenia. Obviously, the T-score less than or equal to negative 2.5. And there are some uh, uh, situations, some organizations like the International Society for Clin Clinical Densitometry, the ISCD, which I'm a, a member of, that will call di the osteoporosis diagnosis if there is an elevated fracture risk as calculated by FRAX, which is a specialty calculator we'll talk about later. A 10-year fracture probability of all fractures above 20% or a 3% 10-year fracture risk at the hip. Also note that when you have a bone mineral density study that there's only one diagnosis per scan, you can't have normal bone at the lumbar spine and osteopenia at the hip, you have osteopenia. You don't have osteopenia at the hip and osteoporosis at the wrist, you have osteoporosis. 
So one diagnosis per scan. This is just a general slide that kind of shows how we're building bone as we grow and, and get to middle, you know, early uh, adulthood and to middle age, our bone density is kind of stable. It's always constantly in a remodeling mode. So we're always laying down bone and uh, reabsorbing bone so that we can remodel bone to keep it healthy. Once we hit menopause as women, we lose one to 2% per year. Men will lose up to a half percent to 1% per year after age 70, just from menop uh, excuse me, bone loss of aging. You'll note that, that there is a lower curve that some environmental factors can cause us to lay down less bone. Uh, might be our genetics. It might be the whether we're sedentary or exercising. It might be with our nutritional intake um, and, and several other factors. Um, this is just a general cartoon that shows there are a lot of factors that go into making bone, and there's a lot of factors going into resorbing bone. And you'll notice, particularly like estrogen deficiency, will will increase bone resorption. Uh, but giving estrogens around menopause or postmenopausally can can hold that back or prevent that. Um, we notice uh, there'll be some immobilization can uh, inhibit bone formation, but increasing mechanical load with exercise can promote bone formation. So there's a lot of different things that can affect your bones. Genetics, we talk about uh, nutrition. We talk about excessive alcohol intake with our patients. We talk about endocrine diseases such as diabetes or thyroid disease or parathyroid disease. We talk about gender, obviously men more so than women because of the estrogen issues. Uh, smoking is a very deleterious effect on um, bones, certain medications. And then we talked about mechanical uh, stress on the bone that is actually helpful for maintaining bone health. These are a list of, uh, of several things that can, and, and it seems like this list can grow and grow that affect our bones hyperparathyroidism. So your parathyroid glands, which are the tiny little glands that sit in the wings of the thyroid that manage our bone metabolism in our life, uh, diabetes, uh, having gastric bypass, having surgical or early menopause, having any one of the connective tissue diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or Sjogren's syndrome or lupus, um, celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, um, hyperthyroidism, anorexia, low exposure to sun, low calcium intake, um, aging is plays a role in uh, certain diseases that cause malabsorption. Um, a lot of medications can affect our bones. Uh, many of us or many people uh, in middle age or older on diuretics for one reason or another aromatase inhibitors for breast cancer uh, patients that are taking that for breast cancer treatment, um, opiates such as hydrocodone and oxycodone um, and any of those painkillers can deteriorate our bones as can the SSRIs and SSNIs. And many people are on that those medications for their mood. Um, the antiandrogens, which are given to men with prostate cancer, uh, glucocorticoids, so uh, persistent steroid use uh, is a problem. Anticonvulsants, so there may be people on um, Kepra, for example, or Levotiracetam for, for convul of convulsions. Uh, gabapentin is also an anticonvulsant, which is used for restless legs and neuropathic pain. Uh, methotrexate, and which is used for rheumatoid arthritis and other arthritis uh, type conditions. And PPIs, such as uh, the acid blockers like uh, omeprazole or pantoprazole. Um, those all have a negative effect on our bones. The first meeting I went to, there was one slide worth of medications. And I think the that, that list of slides is now gone to two and a half or three slides. If you start listing all the medications that have, can have a negative impact on your bones, it's, it's incredible. So when I see a patient with osteoporosis, we should check some labs. And we're joined by my laboratory retriever, Cornbread, who is the color of a pan of cornbread. And he's from the South, so he gets a Southern name. Uh, we do a blood count. Um, we do a chemistry panel, checking your sodium and your potassium and your kidney function. We check magnesium and phosphorus, um, which are important for uh, bone metabolism. Uh, calcium is included in the chemistry panel automatically. We check your vitamin D level. There's a lot of low vitamin D uh, running around in this part of the world because we live so far north and we don't get the exposure that people closer to the equator get in Texas, Florida, Georgia, or Alabama. Um, 
We check a thyroid level because the, again, we had mentioned thyroid disease. We check the parathyroid, particularly if the calcium looks a little off. I always check a testosterone in men because low testosterone can cause bone loss. And I also ask for a 24 hour urine calcium. Um, this seems like a, a, an onerous thing to receive this brown jug and collect urine for 24 hours, but there is a genetic condition wherein uh, the kidneys will spill um, calcium in the urine. And so your body's constantly trying to make up for that. And, and where are they going to get that calcium? They have to drag it out of the bone. So, uh, so and that we find that in about 10% of our patients, actually. Um, we can get some extra labs, uh, depending on our clinical judgment. Um, obviously, with men, I really need to look for why they have osteoporosis. Um, and testosterone is just one of those tests I might get on them. Um, if there's an unexplained fracture or a poor response to treatment, um, there might be an unexpectedly low by, uh, bone mineral density. And at that, we would look at the Z-score. The Z-score would compare your bone density or the patient's bone density with a uh, one of their peers. So the same age, uh, same race, um, same gender. And if it's less than negative 2.0, we start thinking about secondary causes of, of osteoporosis. Um, checking a blood count, we've actually picked up two cases of multiple myeloma because the blood count was off and the chemistries were a little different. And we, we got a serum protein electrophoresis and some other studies and discovered multiple myeloma in two of our patients. We also have uh, wonder about celiac disease or malabsorption. So that might cause us to investigate a few more things. When you come for your bone density, if most, most of y'all may have had one, you see the densitometrist or the densitometry tech sitting in front of the monitor and the patient gets to lay down on the table and take a little nap. And uh, it's actually quite an easy uh, experience, uh, very low uh, uh, exposure to x-ray. You get more x-rays by sitting on an airplane than you do from the DEXA machine. Um, we usually ask that uh, DEXAs are done uh, in postmenopausal woman. Um, after age 70, 65, or men after age 60, but we'll get um, this prior to age 65 if there are a few risk factors. Uh, perhaps your mother broke her hip before age 80. Um, perhaps you have a diagnosis of osteoarthritis, uh, excuse me, rheumatoid arthritis or diabetes or kidney disease or some other things. Maybe you're on long-term steroids or uh, uh, seizure medications. Uh, maybe you smoke, and, and that's something that would cause us to get an earlier uh, bone density. This is what the densitometrist looks at. Um, so when I'm reading, I will look at your hips and I'll look at your lumbar spine, one, two, three, four. And uh, so that's what we're reading and that's why you're laying on that table. We'll also get a forearm if, if they are cer under certain conditions. If we can't read the back because there's too much arthritis or perhaps there's been surgery there, perhaps you've broken a hip or had hip replacement and we can't look at the hips. Um, or if you have para hyperparathyroidism, we'll go ahead and scan the wrist and look at that as well. I mentioned earlier about the FRAX ca calculator, F-R-A-X. This was developed at the University of Sheffield in England and is used around the world. And it takes into account your age, your sex, your weight, your height. Did you have a previous fracture? Did your parent fracture a hip before age 80? Do you smoke? Do you take steroids? Um, do you have rheumatoid arthritis? And a lot of times I will substitute diabetes for that question because it's about the same risk factor. Do you have a cause of secondary osteoporosis such as hyperparathyroidism or, hyperparathyroidism or thyroid disease? Do you take an excess of alcohol? And then we will put in the numbers from your DEXA scan and calculate the risk. The treatment thresholds would be over 20% for a major osteoporotic fracture, which would be your arm, your wrist, your back or your hips. And uh, we would uh, uh, suggest treatment for people over 3% risk for hip fracture alone. So how do we go about osteoporosis treatment? Um, most people wanna know how to do it naturally. Well, there are a few things you can do without getting on FDA approved medications, but keep in mind, we wanna strengthen the bones and we also wanna reduce the risk of future fracture. Uh, the first thing we talk about is getting adequate calcium and vitamin D, and this, this becomes a topic every year. Is this worth it? Um, do, are we getting too much or not enough calcium? Is calcium a waste of time? I actually read a study last night um, at the proceedings of the Santa Fe Osteoporosis uh, meeting that, uh, that the calcium is worth it. Um, 
making sure that we get uh, 1,200 milligrams a day for those women over 50 and men over 70 and under those ages to get at least 1,000. Most of the time, it's best to get it through your diet. Um, you know, and not all people can take dairy, for example, but nuts and um, leafy greens and certain fish. And there are other sources in our diet that are very helpful. We actually have put together this uh, smoothie recipe booklet that our patients really like. Um, but there's also the supplements available, calcium carbonate, calcium citrate. Um, and they're usually accompanied by vitamin D. I usually uh, suggest an 800 to 1,000 units of vitamin D per day as a supplement. Um, some people say that vitamin D doesn't reduce uh, falls or, or fractures, but the, the issue is, is a lot of these studies are done uh, in areas where there's a lot of normal vitamin D. In our far northern latitude in Wisconsin, I can't believe the number of patients that have low vitamin D levels. And vitamin D is very necessary for any of our medications to work properly. Um, there, we also like to get physical therapy involved to uh, do a one-time assessment of fall risk and uh, prevention. And so they'll go over some um, handouts and, and some different exercises for core strengthening, for balance, and for fall risk reduction. And they'll talk to patients about throw rugs and grab bars and uh, electrical cords and uh, ways to minimize um, falls. We also talk to our patients about smoking cessation and limiting alcohol to to three servings or less a day for men, two or less a day for women, and also weight-bearing exercise. So, you know, swimming's great cardiovascular exercise, but it's not pounding the pavement. So anything that causes you to pound the pavement, like walking, jogging, uh, dancing, uh, Zumba, um, aerobics classes, most of those um, will help you with that weight-bearing exercise and promote uh, gains in bone. So osteoporosis treatment by medication. We have several that are anti-resorptive. They prevent bone breakdown, which is predominant in postmenopausal women and in and men as they age. And we also have some bone, uh, bone medications that promote bone formation. And then there's one uh, new kid on the block that actually kind of does both. The bisphosphonates are our first line of anti-resorptive medications. They do re reduce the risk of all fractures at all um, areas with the exception of abandonate. It's not so good with hip fracture prevention, but it does help with vertebral fracture prevention. Um, we can check uh, two ways to check and make sure the medication's working. We can check a uh, fasting CTX, which is a bone turnover marker, and that should be very low if these medications are active. We also check a one-year de uh, bone density study DEXA study to make sure that the bones are not going down anymore and that they're actually starting to stabilize and perhaps go up. Um, when you take a bisphosphonate, the, the effect will hang around the bones for a period of time, up to one to three years. So we usually give bisphosphonates for five years and then give patients a drug holiday to reduce the risk of um, some egregious uh, side effects. Um, the oral agents, you, you'll know them as alendronate, which is Fosamax, Residronate, Ibandronate, um, and then uh, intravenously we can use zalendronate, which is reclassed. Uh, Pomidronate is used at high dose in the oncology patients. Um, we use P with caution in patients with poor dental health, so I always get a dental history on a patient. I'll always tell my patients to tell your dentist that you're change in your health has been that you're on a bone builder that you take once a week or you get a shot twice a year or once a, once a year infusion or whatever. Uh, people with poor, poor kidneys, their, their creatinine clearance or, or glomerular filtration rate is less than 30. I'm really cautious about giving patients any bisphosphonate and certainly I can't give it to people of childbearing age. Um, the adverse effects of bisphosphonates, the biggest one orally is it will cause some GI disruption, some reflux. Uh, I have seen it cause some um, eye irritation in one patient. I have seen one case of atrial fibrillation. Uh, I have seen several patients that complain of musculoskeletal pain, you know, their joints get a little achy. Um, but the biggest ones are osteonecrosis of the jaw where your jaw breaks down or a typical femur fracture where you just get a, this weird fracture across your thigh. 
Most of those latter two, uh, they occur maybe in one in 10,000 to one in 100,000 patients. Um, and if we can keep patients on no more than five years of bisphosphonate and then give them a drug holiday and also be very cognizant of their dental history and work with their dentist, um, we have been able to prevent these latter two um, side effects. Um, if you are going for a routine dental exam and, and cleaning, that's not a big deal. But if they're planning on doing a root canal, implants, or they've got to pull some teeth, um, we need to work with the dentist to time your medication to maybe back off on your oral medication for a while. And once you've healed from your dental procedure, then the dentist can let us know when to uh, resume your medication. Monoclonal, monoclonal antibody is available as denosumab, trade name is Prolia. It's given as a subcutaneous shot under the skin twice a year and it reduces all fractures. It has a very similar effect as bisphosphonate with uh, avoiding uh, bone resorption or, or stemming the bone resorption to allowing the bone building cells to catch up. But it also uh, has the risk factors of atypical femur fracture and osteonecrosis of the jaw. Um, once you stop this medication, it doesn't hang around like the bisphosphonates do. So once that medication is stopped, you will lose all the gains you made with it. And it also has a higher risk up to about 10% of having multiple vertebral fractures in the spine. So if you're on denosumab, you're going to plan on being it for maybe the rest of your life. If you're an older patient, or if you're a younger patient, maybe having this for as a, as a treatment option for three or four years, and then there's an exit strategy. Maybe you uh, finish off with a, a, an in, infusion of, uh, of a bisphosphonate or take a year of alendronate just to maintain the gains that you have made and uh, eliminate the fracture risk. Um, anabolic hormones promote bone building, and we use these. Uh, teriparatide, which is Forteo, abaloperatide is Timloss, uh, patients give themselves a subcutaneous shot every day, sort of like insulin. Um, they're related to the parathyroid hormone, and they do de decrease the fractures at all levels. Um, um, but there's, there's, and they're pretty sure that it helps with hips, but mainly for the spine and non-vertebral fractures. These are used as well uh, preoperatively for patients that are planning to have some sort of vertebral surgery, like a fusion. The surgeons want to make sure that those screws are going to stick in there, and if the bones are soft or if there's a case of osteoporosis, they want to treat, pre-treat patients for three to six months with these medications before they have surgery. Um, this is also um, useful in situations when there's been a treatment failure or patients have had excessive fractures or if they're on chronic steroids or their T-score is extremely low, like less, less than negative 3.5. Um, the two-year lifetime on Terry Paradide has recently been lifted. Um, that was given earlier because rats treated with this medication had developed some um, bone cancer, but in 20 years of treatment with teriparatide, there's never been a case in humans. So that two-year lifetime ban has been lifted. So you could take it for two years, go to something else, and then resume it for two years if you need it again. A baloteriparatide continues to have an 18-month lifetime ban. Um, the effect, again, only lasts as long as you're taking it. So once you stop this medication, you have to follow up with another medication like a bisphosphonate or denosumab, um, or you'll lose all the gains that you got. Um, the newest kit on the block is romazosumab, which uh, blocks a hormone that inhibits bone formation. And it's given as two shots under the skin once a month for 12 months. And this has to be followed as well by a backup um, medication, but it does uh, uh, actually inhibits some in, um, bone resorption as well. So um, I like this medication because it's short. And if you have any reactions, like you don't tolerate the injection, or um, if there's any other, uh, you know, maybe a calcium high or low or something that you're not tolerating, it's easy to get off of it. Um, there has been a contraindication in patients that have had a recent cardiac event. So I'm cautious about using this medication in patients that uh, have uh, a recent MI, myocardial infarction or heart attack, or some other cardiac uh, problems but it is a, is a welcome addition to our regimen. Uh, estrogens can still be used um, immediately postmenopausally. You know, if you undergo estrogen, if you undergo menopause at age 55 and want to continue till age 60, uh, that's probably still a consideration. But once at age 60, you need to probably get off the estrogen because of the higher risk for strokes and blood clots. 
Uh, calcitonin is an oldie, but can be used. Um, usually it's intranasally. It's not as effective, but it's a backup plan if we need it. And raloxifen and tamoxifen are some oldies, but goodies as well that we have in the back pocket if we need to. Um, this is kind of a neat graphic. So we talked about osteonecrosis of the bone and that uh, atypical femur fractures. Um, if we had a thousand people on osteoporosis medications for five years, the green dot means that one would have that uh, weird AFF or atypical femur fracture and the blue dot represents, represents the one patient that would have a jaw issue. Whereas if you took a thousand women and they, they had osteoporosis but didn't get treated, these red dot rep, dots represent that 50% represent that of them will go on to have a fragility fracture without treatment. Um, so the treatment osteoporosis, we can reduce the risk of subsequent fractures by up to 50% and can reduce the mortality rate. Again, there is mortality and morbidity with having a fragility fracture. Um, I ask you to, I encourage you to talk to your primary care doctors and providers um, because we have uh, at least 53 million Americans right now that are at risk for bone fracture. Most of them haven't been screened or treated appropriately. It's estimated that less than 21% of patients with osteoporosis are receiving the appropriate treatment, and we need to uh, do better than that. Right here at Marshfield, we're getting close to 50% since we formed our program a few years ago, um, so I'm hoping that that continues to grow. Um, uh, we, I encourage you to learn about your family history and other risk factors for osteoporosis and what you can do to keep your bones strong with, uh, with regards to smoking and exercise and diet and alcohol. This is our several pictures of our bone team. Uh, I just love working with these ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we try to get out to the dairy fest breakfasts and then uh, farm technology days and do some presentations like we're doing today. Um, so please feel free to contact our uh, bone health uh, uh, our team or ask your primary care provider to get us and in, in, get in touch with us. And we can certainly see you and perform an evaluation or help your primary care provider provide for your uh, bone health needs. Um, we have a lot of handouts too, and I think they'll be available through the um, uh, Security Health Plan Academy um, that with regards to exercise and calcium in the diet, et cetera. So right now I'll take questions. Thank you so much. Um, I, I do have two that I think we can sneak in here before um, the noon hour. And then on if anybody on the call today has a question, you're more than welcome to submit it via the chat feature, which is located toward the bottom of your screen. But the first question I have for you today is, once you have a bone test density study showing osteoporosis, do follow-up scans always have to be on the same machine? What if you change providers? That's a very good question, and it's a very hot topic in, in the ISCD world or the osteoporosis world. You have to go from machine to machine. So if you got it here at the Marshfield campus, it needs to stay at the Marshfield campus. If you got it on the mobile unit in Colby, you can get it on the mobile any of the mobile units that go to Colby or Stratford or Wisconsin Rapids. Um, if you did, a, if you had it done at um, in Duluth. Uh, and, and you wanna have it done here because you've moved here. You can have it done here, there's no problem, but I, I, we will not be able to compare it to your previous uh, team uh, or your previous study in Duluth. Um, and, and following you sequentially to make sure you're getting the benefit of the medication and when to, when to do the drug holiday is very important. That's a very good question. And another question we received is, will mild osteoporosis get better with, um, I'm going to say this wrong, bisphosphonate treatment? Yes, that, um, it absolutely does improve um, uh, bone mineral density. So your bones should get stronger and it, it does reduce fracture risk. Um, so that's that's our mainstay right now. That's, the one, that's our go-to at first, um, unless there are some other uh, what comorbidities or problems that you have that keep us from giving you that. If you have reflux or you didn't tolerate the bisphosphonate, we would go to something else, but the bisphosphonates are very, very helpful. A follow-up to that was how long do you need to take it? Okay. Orals, um, we you like, like if you're taking Fosamax or Alendronate once a week, we usually say uh, five years and uh, depending on how you're doing, maybe 10 years, but no longer than 10 years. I like to look at five years and if you've had a response, give you a drug holiday 
recheck your bones in two years with another scan. And if you're starting to have a decline, then we can resume it at that point. But the point is that you've had a drug holiday. Studies have shown that more than five years of an IV, so if you were given reclass for five years, I usually try to give it for just three and no more than five. And that way we've been able to uh, avoid the osteonecrosis of the jaw and the atypical femur fractures. Okay, I think I'm gonna sneak in one more question here. Um, what are the risks of not taking medication as treatment? Very good question, because I have some people that say, I'm, I'm just not taking that stuff. I would say, well, okay, it's your decision. Um, and I have had some people, I say, well, look, we'll have you work on the vitamin D, core, you know, weight-bearing exercises and calcium, and uh, we'll recheck you in two years. If you have a, an interval fracture, then obviously that changes our game plan. And I have been able to have people come back and their bones are still osteoporotic. They still have osteoporosis. Um, but they've been able to stabilize their bones by working hard on minimizing alcohol, getting getting off the couch and, and pounding the pavement and uh, getting enough vitamin D and calcium. Um, but you still have that higher fracture risk because you're uh, you're uh, you're still in that osteoporosis range. But it, it I have done it with some patients that don't want to take the medications. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and anybody that's on the call or, or views the, the presentation following um, today's live event, you're welcome to submit a question at any point and we will work to get that answered for you. Um, and as, as, as Dr. Mayo had mentioned, we will have um, a follow-up communication that's sent out and it will contain links to any question that was submitted beforehand. Um, we'll have answers there. And then some of these um, documents that are shown on the screen, will have links to those as well. Thank you all so much for being such a, uh, for inviting me. I enjoyed speaking with everybody. Yes, and we're, we were very fortunate to have you um, on. So thank you again and um, be well, everybody. All right, thank you all. Have a good day. Yes.